Just to the speakers. Uh, 两两位嘉宾，还有我们的那个同场老师，我们这边马上就要开始了。Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. A very warm welcome to the Urban Resilience Practice from Northeast Asian Cities Seminar online. I'm Qin Hui from CityNet. I'm very honored to be able to moderate today's online seminar. And this seminar is co-hosted by CityNet, World Resources Institute, and RT City from Beijing. So. By the end of this morning, we have uh, uh, received over 310 registrations for this meeting. So this is the first one of our series of uh, discussions on the urban resilience practices from Northeast and Asian cities. So this, um, please allow me, first of all, to introduce our partners for this meeting. So next slide, please. The World Resources Institute was founded back in 1982. We are headquartered in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. and is devoted to reduce poverty, develop the economy, and protect the natural system. In the past 40 years, WRI has, through explorative research methodologies and tools and data platforms and analysis to offer reference and support to scientific decision making in the world in 2008, WRI established its first overseas office in Beijing. And the four project areas that we're looking at from the Chinese office are climate and energy, sustainable city, food and natural resources, and Belt and Road Initiative. Another part of ours, Archie City, was founded back in 1999 and is a professional consultant company which um, both looks at domestic and international status quo. Since its founding, it has been integrating industrial resources and uh, um, focused on urban rural development and ecological protection and has been offering high quality consultant services to government agencies and research institutes in China and is devoted to internationalization of Chinese cities. So I would like to thank the two partners again for your support. Next, please allow me to introduce the host of this meeting, CityNet. CityNet is the largest association of urban stakeholders committed to sustainable development with a goal to connect urban actors and deliver tangible solutions for cities in the Asia Pacific region. CityNet was founded back in 1980 seven together with SCAP, UNDP, and UN Habitat. They supported us to found CityNet. Up to now, we have uh, 173 total members, 110 full members, 58 associates, and five corporates. So in associates, we have uh, design and planning institutes or universities and other uh, kinds of government agencies. So these are the major activities that CityNet launch across the spectrum. You see that we focus on capacity building of all kinds. First of all, we have an online platform, what we call Urban SDG Knowledge Platform. Okay. 
This platform is co-hosted by CityNet, the Seoul Metropolitan Government and the United Nations ASCAP. If you're interested, you could uh, go to our website, the CityNet's website, to know more about urban SDG knowledge platform that we have established. Actually, it could bring you a lot of value and knowledge on sustainable development of cities. No. 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 Go back to. Well, the I'm sorry, yes, 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 yes. This is it. So, um, uh, 除了除了这样的线上平台，我们会定期举办很多的线下。嗯 ，In addition to such online urban SDG knowledge platforms, we have、uh, offline training workshops. Um, for example, um, training classes to build the capacity of the member ba members based on their needs. We have uh, a lot of training partners. For example, the Seoul Human Resources Development Center as our partners to increase our capacity building efforts. In addition, together with the EU and uh, some international agencies, we are also launching um, capacity building activities to connect cities to cities and in, improve synergies among cities. Apart from all those, we are also looking at thematic areas that cities are interested in. And we're developing with our members such thematic area programs. Apologize for some delays on the showing of PPTs, the showing of slides. But now we are coming to the workshop part. What you see on the slide is the uh, um, field trip visit together with uh, the uh, Seoul Metropolitan Government. So it's, also, it's about sustainable solutions for smart cities. And uh, it gathered 14 urban experts and 14 representatives from different cities. So we are also looking forward to such offline activities after COVID-19 together with all of you. So these are the objectives of our meeting this afternoon. First of all, we hope to increase the capacities of local governments from the Asia Pacific on urban resilience with cross-cutting themes on disaster preparedness, emergency management, disaster relief, and long-term post-disaster recovery. And secondly, we hope to exchange new theoretical concepts, global situation, and best practices on urban resilience for cities in Northeast Asia. And thirdly, we hope to build consensus towards understanding the current framework of urban resilience for cities in the Asia Pacific. We hope that through three sessions from today till the day after tomorrow, you could gain a clearer knowledge of what resilient cities are and also um, more about city net. As you can see on our slide, the agenda for the webinar is displayed. And first of all, for today, for this afternoon, you will hear from Mr. Um, Xing Haiming, Chinese ambassador to South Korea. And then you will hear from Mr. Hyung uh, Yin, City Net Chief Executive Officer, who will send a welcome message to all distinguished guests, and then we will hear two lectures from Ms. Wen Yixi and Dr. Zhao Zhen. So your questions and comments are very welcome during the meeting sessions because we have such Q&A button in Zoom meeting room. So please explore such functions and raise your questions if you like. So next, we're very honored to display to you the video message sent by um, Chinese Ambassador to South Korea, Mr. Xin Haiming. Mr. Xin um, is very busy these days, so she, uh, he'll have to take his time out of his tight schedule to record a video to show to us. So next, the video from 
Xin Haiming, Chinese Ambassador to South Korea. So, dear friends, good afternoon. I'm Xin Haiming, Chinese Ambassador to ROK. I'm very pleased to be part of today's seminar on behalf of the Chinese Embassy in the South, uh, South Korea. I would like to extend my warmest thanks to CityNet for holding such a meeting. This seminar aims to explore the resilient city practice in Northeastern Asian cities, which is really relevant to all of us in today's world. Development of cities around the world are faced with an increasing uncertainty, extreme climate uh, resource shortage, uh, terrorist attacks and public health events and emergencies are threatening the stable lives of our people. In particular, in this year, COVID-19 has brought a lot of uh, loss in terms of life and poverty. Uh, um, uh, for people across the world. So against such a backdrop, a resilient city as a new concept has become a new direction for responding to the urban crisis and uh, uh, seeking sustainable development has become a hotspot of international concern. China has attached great importance to the development of resilient cities not long ago. The fifth plenary session of the 19th Party Committee of China deliberated and passed the 14th five-year plan for national economy and social development, and also the uh, suggestions on 2035 vision for that plan. In this suggestions document, China proposed that we need to improve the city's capabilities in flood control and drainage and build sponge city and resilient cities. Half of the world's population resides in cities. 70% of the economic total totality of the uh, GDP of the world comes from cities. Collaboration in, among cities is one important link in international exchanges. Uh, in particular for China in recent years, against the backdrop of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, a large number of Chinese cities are trying to go global and to connect to uh, cities along the Belt and Road to seek globalization and promote economic development in the world. During the important speech delivered by President Xi in 27th on uh, official meeting, of uh, um, Asia meeting, economic and social development meeting. It was proposed by President Xi that we need to build a community of a shared future in Asia Pacific area, which is open, inclusive, innovative, and interconnected and win-win. We hope to um, lead the case study into smart cities and facilitate the implementation of guidelines in terms of smart cities to offer a template of the innovation city construction Asia Pacific. We will also connect internal economic cycle with external economic cycle and create a even wider collaboration space for uh, cities, both in China and in other countries. Since our establishment of diplomatic relationship between China and uh, uh, South Korea, our political mutual trust has been strengthened and our economic and trade collaboration has been reinforced and our people to be people exchanges have become more vigorous. Our collaboration and relationship has been developing on all fronts and exchanges among cities between China and South Korea is also one important channel for uh, the two countries to seek mutually beneficial relationship and uh, improve the uh, uh, relationship of the people among our peoples. So cities from China and South Korea are helping each other during COVID-19 and have it best explained the um, what a saying that is a friend in need is a friend indeed. And we have become a template in fighting COVID-19 um, across national borders. So we hope that the participants of this meeting can strengthen your exchanges and have a deeper discussions on building of resilient cities in uh, Northeastern Asia. I wish this 
seminar complete success and wish all of you good health and good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Xing, for your speech. And we're very honored to have uh, heard your speech. Just like Mr. Xing has mentioned, in post-COVID era, our collaboration in Resilient City will become more pragmatic and practice-based. And we hope to become such a platform for exchanges on practice of urban resilience for Northeastern Asian countries. Next, we would like to invite Mr. Gong Hyung Yim, sitting at Chief Executive Officer, to deliver a welcome message. The floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased very to pleased see you safe and sound in this, in this challenging period. Most of all, I would like to welcome all of you to join us at today's webinar. I would uh, particularly like to note that today's webinar is being hosted in close collaboration with uh, WRI China and Beijing Archie City Consulting Limited. Well, this year, due to the pandemic situation, CityNet has had the most of its events and activ activities online. So today's webinar is the 14th of such webinars ever since we hosted the first one early in April, right after the outbreak of the pandemic. Well, it is a source of my great pleasure to announce that at today's webinar, we have registered an unprecedentedly large number of participants from all over the Asia Pacific region, in particular, many of them from China. To our eyes, this is a very encouraging signal because CityNet so far has maintained rather a weak link with China. We are well aware that Chinese cities have made primary progress in urban development and they are willing to share their experiences with other cities. I hope that this webinar will serve as a momentum to promote cooperation between CityNet and many Chinese cities in the not too distant future. Well, having said that, please allow me to brief you on the contents of our seminar today. Well, it is heartbreaking to see that cities have suffered from the pandemic and then have been disturbed further by the massive annual flooding and typhoons. The resilience of the city has been challenged more than ever before. Today's session will feature lectures regarding climate resilience and the economic loss assessment by applying a flood footprint methodology. We hope this webinar will be able to provide you with more context regarding the enhancement of city resilience. Section two. Session two focuses on the evaluation framework for urban resilience in line with the new normal on the COVID-19 pandemic and sustainable development. This session will help local government to evaluate the capacity of the city to strengthen and improve weakness accordingly and become more resilient in the future. Finally, in session three, we are honored to have four representatives from cities in China, Japan, and Korea to share their local resilience practices. Please enjoy the lecture 
and share your opinions and questions through the chat platform. Where CityNet sees cities as opportunities to become solution providers. We hope to become a sustainable platform for exchange of ideas, resources, and solutions for our cities across the Asia Pacific. When knowledge and solutions are collectively shared, we accelerate the process of changes towards our common goal. That is, a better urban future for everyone. I once again welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us today. We hope this webinar is fruitful for everyone. And finally, please, please, Stay safe. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Yin, for your wonderful remarks. Next, we move to the keynote speech session. I'd like to invite the first speaker this afternoon, Ms. Wen Yixi. She will talk about unlocking the potential for transformative climate adaption in cities. Ms. Xi is a research analyst from WRI China. And uh, Ms. Wen, uh, Ms. Xi has uh, done a lot of uh, projects to promote uh, climate change related uh, uh, progress in China and in other related countries. She has uh, carried out a lot of uh, research uh, programs and she got uh, a master degree from Duke University. And then she also got her uh, bachelor degree in China. Mrs. Xi, please. Okay, now I'd like to share my screen. Uh, distinguished Mr. King, distinguished guests, um, Good afternoon, and I'm Xi Wenyi. I'm from WRI, and I'd like to thank uh, CityNet for your invitation. I've done some research in the climate change area, and uh, this is the first time to share my ideas with you on this uh, platform. Um, so this is a really honor for me, and I hope that we can have more conversation communications in the future. Uh, I'd like to share one thing uh, first, uh, that is uh, the Global Commission on Adaption, uh, which was uh, held in uh, Denmark and uh, uh, 28 countries joined this uh, commission, including countries like uh, China, Indonesia, etc., to promote adaption uh, actions. We also invite uh, the former uh, UN Secretary General and uh, Bill Gates and uh, George Even to lead the Global Commission on Adaption, WRI, and the Global Commission on Adaption co-organize uh, the daily work of this uh, commission. So I'd like to share some of our work in the past two years um, at GCA. After one year of research, Last year, we launched a report called uh, Adaption Actions Immediately. We identified a few systems for action, including agriculture and food security, cities, uh, finance, uh, preventing disasters, etc. Um, so as you can see that the city is an important part of the whole framework. So I'm happy to share with uh, the uh, research in this area. Our research focuses on um, four areas. 
um, first of all, multi-sexual perspective collaboration across the skills for systematic change. Uh, second, focus on inclusion, equality, poverty elevation, and climate justice. It means that we should not only look at climate change, we also need to give attention to vulnerable groups. Third, triple dividend, avoided losses, economic benefits, and the social environmental benefits. Um, we have uh, some uh, system design like the early warning uh, system. Uh, actually, this uh, kind of investment is uh, uh, very cost effective because they can prevent direct um, loss, it can also bring social and environmental benefits. Fourth, synergy cross mitigation, adaption, sustainable development priorities uh, can be achieved. For example, a better city planning can reduce transportation um, and um, making it easy for people to commute and uh, uh, some climate uh, change related risks can be mitigated so um, re relevant risk can be reduced uh, for people living in the cities so next i'd like to share about why cities are so important in climate change campaign uh, as you can see the next generation of urbanization will be different from now. Uh, if you look at the uh, circles, uh, they show uh, the uh, population change. You can see a lot of the population increase will happen in Africa, in South part of Asia, and in Central America. These areas uh, have also have the most climate risk and urban poor with uh, um, temperature increase by two degree. Uh, these cities will faced by the rising sea levels, etc. And this fastest growing cities also have the least resources. On the left hand side, you can see the yellow bar. The yellow bar represent the city population. The purple bar on the right hand represent the budget per capita. So, you can see a lot of cities in Africa, of South Africa, like Durban, uh, Mumbai, Surat in India, their population is much higher than cities like Singapore, uh, Yokohama, uh, New York. However, the budget for these uh, um, cities, for the poor cities, is still uh, small. So. Uh, for these uh, uh, cities to develop, they cannot adopt an uh, incremental adaption solution. And they need to take uh, more transformative approaches to pursue a deep long-term systematic change. So you can see that uh, uh, it's important for cities to take a part in the climate change campaign. And the cities are located in different areas and locations. So uh, different cities are faced with uh, different uh, vulnerabilities, uh, but there are a few um, prominent ones. For example, one in 10 people globally live in areas less than 10 meters above sea level. It means that uh, these uh, uh, cities will at a high risk of uh, uh, higher sea levels and the tsunami. Second, urban areas in drylands with over 2 billion people, they are facing uh, water stress and frequent drought. And the third is unplanned growth and unregulated construction have st striped away natural protection. Uh, for example, biodiversity is facing greater challenge and the cities are becoming more and more vulnerable. And this climate related burdens are falling disproportionately on the poor and the vulnerable groups. And over 800 million urban residents live in informal settlements like uh, slums or shabby uh, houses. 
and so they don't have good access to basic service and the coping resources and uh, there's a very few way for them to air their opinion uh, politically and uh, if there is any uh, threat this population will be at the front of this uh, threat so we can see that uh, the quality of uh, this uh, people are going to be increasing or uh, as a uh, word get worse in the future and uh, here you can see the economic and social cost of climate change in cities if we don't take any action each year one trillion cost would be incurred and it is equal to 546 billion dollars per year of gdp lost that's why cities need to begin to adapt as soon as possible and take actions asap so According to the cases we studied across the world, we generalized, we summarized three areas for cities to explore the way forward. First of all, we need to plan delivery infrastructure differently informed by credible climate risk data. First of all, we need the cities to take a good grasp of uh, credible localized climate risk data. They need to use satellite data and other advanced technologies to get credible localized climate risk data. Secondly, they need to build capacity to use data in an integrated and inclusive manner. Thirdly, mainstream adaptation needs to be done within city agencies and across sectors to better leverage all these information. So urban planning, investment, operation, infrastructure, building, all of these areas need to be integrated with data use. Just like I've mentioned just now, we need to have cross-cutting collaboration in different sectors. Next, I hope to explore with you several cases to know more about this point. First of all, let's look at Notre Dame, which is uh, in Netherlands, and it is of low altitude, and now it is under the risk of uh, being merged by water due to water um, sea level rises. So first of all, they need to identify the risk of uh, climate change. So they have established an analysis framework and due to this analysis framework, they have established a transportation energy system and water facilities centered analysis network. And they could look at the service capacities of the infrastructure under different scenarios. And due to different demands, they could engage in in-depth researches. For example, as you can see on this slide, they have established a um, transportation system with uh, pre-warning uh, mechanisms. In 2013, they have announced their climate adaptation strategic plan. So just like I've mentioned, we hope that cities could establish a science-based climate change response information system as soon as possible. The second example is Surat. In 2006, Surat underwent a very severe flooding. 75% of the land of this city was underwater. 150 people died and a huge economic loss was incurred. So during the flooding, the uh, reservoir upstream collapsed. That's why severe flood took place due to a greater and more severe flooding in that summer. They 
underwent very severe flooding and they hope they started to gain more understanding of uh, the flooding back then and they established a model as you can see on the slide this is a hydrological model of surat as a city so they used such a model to predict weather and based on that they have established an end-to-end -end system to give warning to people before the flood takes place before they only had one day to prepare for floods and now they have several days four to five days to make preparation for the oncoming flood so all due to the SCCT, which is the Surat Climate Change Trust, which was established by this city. 12 organizations helped to establish such a trust, including agricultural, uh, meteorological, and the disaster management agencies. And they also had the um, um, dam management agencies and state government and the municipal government in support of such the uh, a trust so they are mitigating climate related risk through such SCCT and their um, weather prediction models the next is New Orleans it is located in Louisiana in the United States and it is the second natural gas producer and uh, second largest uh, um, petroleum producer in the US compared to other states. So if it is faced with a climate disaster, the loss would be very big. So in 2015, Hurricane Katrina severely uh, brought severe damage to New Orleans, bringing about very severe economic losses. New Orleans strengthened its understanding of climate change since then, and they started to release the climate change-related plan, which they call the Integrated Plan against uh, to respond to climate change. They tried to integrate their urban infrastructure with uh, consideration over climate change. And as you can see on this picture, they had more predictions over the rising sea levels what kind of preparation they could take and how would the weather fare in the near future all of these are being uh, analyzed in such a report so you can see the dams and also their retreat plans for the city residents so Such a plan is a multiple plan integration plan. A lot of cities and departments in different cities have such plans in place, but they don't have an integrated plan or a guideline to carry out those plans. So we hope that departments from different cities could issue such integrity plans or guidelines before the disaster takes place. Next, I think we see from New Orleans and the Surat, all these cities only responded after disaster occurred. So we hope to call upon cities across the world to make preparations to avoid such disasters, to prevent such disaster from taking place instead of taking um, the passive approach against the disasters when they take place or when they happen. So secondly, the research hopes to also deliver a message to all of you that we need to build resilience of vulnerable communities at the same time. It has two aspects to it. First, I will strengthen local adaptive capacity and address access to basic services, in particular for those informal settlements. We hope to offer a safe settlement to residents to make their environment more livable. Secondly, we hope to tap into citizen knowledge and experience to create more effective and inclusive adaptation strategies. In the interest of time, I don't have enough 
time to share with you many cases, but here I hope to share with you the, um, tha the uh, an example from Thailand. This is a community participation mechanism established by Thailand. And it's also called their safe housing plan. You can see the before and after effects from this project. So before the uh, renovation, the settlement was very dangerous, precarious to be exact. But after renovation, you can see their settlement became safer and more livable and more and greener, right? So over 90,000 families from uh, over 15,000 uh, communities benefited from such a safe housing plan in Thailand. The effective implementation of such a plan was due to a community participation mechanism established by the Thailand, Thailand government, Thai government. So they had uh, uh, survey mapping work done and they also introduced a step by step plan for such a safe housing projects. So the residents were beneficiaries from such a safe housing plan, but also facilitators to safe housing plan. So you might be curious, why so low cost for such a great, uh, such a wonderful renovation? That is also due to the community participation mechanism that they established. They had such a co cooperative established. So such the cooperative established could gain easier access to loans. And through such cooperatives, they could enjoy better interest, maybe lower interest for their loans which was in facilitation of the implementation of the plans. So through this case, we hope that you can know that we can leverage the force of the local communities to carry out our projects. A lot of international organizations are also launching their programs in this area. For example, ACCA have in over 200 countries uh, launched their community renovation plans or programs. So this organization in 2018 initiated the Know Your City initiative. They called upon youths from over 100 cities to establish a joint platform. And on this platform, they would instill the information of their respective cities and they would put introductions or briefings of their cities on this platform so that cities could uh, um, engage in better collaborative work with each other. So you could also log on to such a website to know more. Thirdly, nature-based solutions. Cities need to attach importance to nature-based solutions. For example, community gardens, green rooftops, increasing permeable surfaces and implementing ecosystem-based protection. For example, we need to look at mangroves and their role in preventing storms. So we believe those are very successful programs by restoration of over 40 million uh, hectares of forests. The mud slides could be stopped and uh, over 1.5 million US dollars could be saved. These numbers come from a local case we have uh, um, collected. On the other hand, the cities must move from water distributors to holistic water managers. And uh, cities must prevent green gentrification at the same time. That means we are not building forest parks for the sake of building forest parks because they must be close to public service of a city. So we should not establish forest parks too far from the downtown so that nobody could enjoy the um, nature. So that was not visible and actionable. So green gentrification should be prevented 
And here are some scientific analysis tools that we have leveraged in building uh, more resilient cities. So you can see that all these trees are here and uh, what the areas with trees planted have lower temperature, lower average temperature than the other areas. So the plantations on the rooftops could also help to reduce the average temperature of the rooftops. So WRI also have many other effective analysis tools. So if we have more time for exchanges in the future, I could share those, the information of those tools with you. We hope that everybody could make better use of such analysis tools to carry out their urban management work. We also requires accountable institutions and governance, inclusion and equality spirit, finance and local capabilities, knowledge, data and partnerships, etc. So here I want to say a few words about uh, financial resources to support uh, related constructions and development. So I believe a lot of the cities are interested in this. How can they get money to fund all these uh, uh, projects and now most of these projects are funded by the government we hope that uh, private sectors will be mobilized to participate in the smart city development for example city government can work with real estate developers and infrastructure developers to evaluate the value of these uh, resilience projects so they, when they see the value, they are more interested in investing in it. And there are also some uh, funds available like multilateral uh, banks uh, like ADB. Uh, they have uh, about 50% of uh, the city related uh, uh, funds uh, supporting city to do resilience uh, projects. And the UK government also uh, offer financial package to support least developed countries to um, take on climate related projects. So if you are interested, please also free to contact me. I can also share some of these resources with you. And I well know that uh, synergy can be achieved between urban adaption and SDG. Here are listed the 17 SDG goals. I mentioned uh, three areas, uh, spatial planning and infrastructure delivery, people-centric and inclusive approaches, and uh, nature-based solution. And uh, these uh, three uh, measures uh, have directly or indirectly related with SDGs. For example, poverty alleviation. Um, they have a great interaction between them. And finally, I want to share with you uh, that in January next year, GC is going to release the initiative in the year of action. We hope that uh, uh, at this uh, initiative or uh, conference, uh, we can um, get more cities on board for the resilience uh, progress and the projects. Uh, first of all, we want to expand national and international investment in climate resilient city. Second, we want to build the climate resilience of the urban poor and we also support network of cities to develop implement resilient urban water uh, system and uh, for example uh, i know that uh, citynet and uh, a few other institutions are also working in this direction the forces uh, to uh, escalate uh, uh, the um, uh, projects and uh, initiative and uh, what I talk about uh, is also available on this website uh, you are welcome to log on to our website to get more information thank you thank you Mr. Xi for your sharing uh, we got a lot of uh, information from her um, presentation I believe 
the audience also feel the same. And I read the uh, chat box, and uh, one of the participants asked a question. Uh, there are any guidelines or standards for resilient city construction? Um, actually, we have some global. Okay, so this is a question from a Chinese city. I have to say that we don't have a, a guideline or standard for resilient uh, city in China, but I know that uh, the uh, uh, the thermals in China is uh, working on um, relevant uh, guidelines. Uh, it hasn't been cited when it will be launched, but I believe it will be helpful for the Chinese cities to be more resilient. And uh, we have seen a few other international organizations uh, uh, have a framework of resilient city construction. Uh, some EU uh, countries uh, also have a similar uh, guidelines. Uh, if you're interested, I can uh, share the link, uh, the website link in the chat box later. And uh, the, these guidelines are very, uh, some of them are very specific about the uh, steps to take to build a resilient city. As we all know that uh, sponge cities uh, is a popular topic uh, in China. Since the uh, 14th five-year plan, as well as the 2030 agenda, quite a few cities have come up to their plan of building a sponge uh, cities. However, sponge cities is a very small part of city resilience. So I believe that urban resilience is more uh, holistic or comprehensive approach uh, to get city ready for some potential risks. Uh, am I right? Uh, actually, resilience uh, covers a wide range of areas. Uh, uh, for a city, for a nation, or even for the whole world. And a resilient city uh, is only part of all that. Um, and a, a sponge city is only part of it. It's more about infrastructure. But uh, there are other areas like uh, ecological system, uh, agriculture, water resources management, etc. So it is a uh, fair to say that sponge city is a, a good measure, but there are also areas that deserve our attention, like agriculture. You mentioned that WRI is working on uh, assessment of full city resilience uh, uh, projects. We are not only uh, look at uh, the sponge uh, city, but also the agriculture sectors, and also uh, dams to prevent uh, rising sea levels, uh, like in Shenzhen. So um, resilience is really uh, inclusive, covering a wide range of areas. Uh, we are very happy to see that uh, Chinese and uh, uh, other part and other countries are getting more and more interested in the concept of resilience. Uh, next, I'd like to ask a question. You gave examples uh, uh, like Rotterdam, Surat, and uh, uh, New Orleans, United States. These three cities uh, are at a different uh, stage of development. When collecting data at WRI, I believe you have you encounter some difficulties in the process of collecting data. If a city wants to do similar projects or evaluation, what a challenge 
uh, they will face in terms of uh, data collection and how they can tackle these difficulties. Uh, yes, I think uh, data collection is not only a challenge for climate adaptation, but also for climate mitigation. I gave three examples, the examples of three cities. Uh, um, because we get uh, these uh, examples from our partners, uh, we don't do project with them directly. As you mentioned, that uh, uh, resiliency infrastructure projects, if we want to get to know the local data and the information, we need to build a good relation with the local government. We also need the support and approval of the local government. Uh, risk analysis um, and uh, other uh, information are actually owned by different uh, uh, authorities, uh, uh, government agencies. So you have to work with uh, different uh, uh, agencies. Uh, uh, in China, for example, we work a lot with the Ministry of Ecology and Environment. They will take a lead uh, to working together with uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, government agencies, uh, water uh, ministries, uh, agricultural ministries uh, to get uh, uh, data and information. But I think um, the attention of the local cities is very important. I just to give you an example, we work with the Wuhan uh, city government in China uh, and uh, uh, the mayor and uh, other government officials in the Wuhan city government uh, gave a lot of attention to this uh, project. We worked uh, very well. We got a lot of support from different uh, uh, government agencies to get uh, information and data. It worked very well. As, uh, uh, as I uh, mentioned in the enabler slide, that uh, strong leadership is very important. Yes, I totally agree. I have another question. The uh, research you carried out about these three cities, are you going to release the information of these three examples uh, uh, publicly, uh, so everyone get access to it, or you're just doing these uh, three projects uh, to help the local government, because uh, some people are afraid that uh, uh, this uh, kind of information, if made public, uh, will have the impact on, for example, the land value, um, city planning, etc. So my question is uh, the your research project about the city planning, uh, are they going to be released to the public or is it uh, uh, only uh, accessible for the local government? I have to explain that uh, these three cases uh, were not done by us. Um, and actually the city government and the local institutions uh, work on uh, the resilience uh, projects and we just uh, um, get access to these uh, projects and uh, we knew they are doing very well. So we just uh, borrow these examples and uh, share the good cases uh, uh, with the public. Uh, as far as I know, very few cities uh, release or made this information public. But for New Orleans uh, City, United States, uh, they like to share their data and the information uh, to the public. Uh, and uh, so uh, this kind of information is uh, uh, accessible online, uh, but a very few Chinese city have done this. Okay, so it seems that we're still making progress. I have another question. Uh, Sponge City is uh, uh, moving to uh, the goal of resilience. Uh, and uh, in some emergency situation, you know, how can we improve the uh, resilience and preparedness of cities? Uh, as for the pre-warning, I'm not an expert. 
I will try my best. I have to say that uh, the government leadership matters. You need to coordinate the different uh, agencies and uh, departments. For example, you need to do a risk uh, analysis and evaluation first. For example, you can invite like a Chinese Academy of uh, Science or the uh, Metropolitan uh, or the Meteorology Bureau uh, to conduct a uh, risk evaluation. After you get aware of the risk, then you come up with a more targeted plan. And after that, uh, you can uh, allocate uh, the work and projects of different uh, uh, agencies and different uh, uh, departments.具体的就是说从技术技术水平上说怎么来来做这种防灾预警系统啊时间关系呢我们下面邀请我们第二位嘉宾公共管理学院副研究员从产业链角度出发采用经济学方法投入产出模型评估灾害引发的间接经济损失和灾后恢复模式现在可以看见吗然后呢我们这些年主要是在基于产业链角度去核算评估这个自然灾害引发的经济损失这里呢我主要是以这个洪水灾害 So as you can see, my title is Foot, foot, uh, Flood Footprint Assessment Measuring Foot Induced Flood Induced Economic Impact Cascading Throughout Production Supply Chains In recent years, we have seen that uh, disasters are having a greater okay, impact so on our that, uh, lives First of all, the temperature increase are leading are to a lot of uh, and, uh, changes. For example, sea level rises, glacier melting, the heavy rain, hurricane, and the uh, coastal years. flooding have become and increasingly frequent. Sorry? Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, since Do we have any technical glitch on English, Chinese, uh, Chinese English simultaneous interpreting? So could everyone hear me, interpreting here? Please pause so for a second. So here are some technical glitches. So please, a minute, please. Uh, 
Sorry, Dr. Zen, for that interruption. So technical glitch was resolved, so the audience could hear you now. So could you proceed with your slide, or should I return to the beginning of this slide? Or yeah, sure. Um, make yourself at home. So sorry. Yeah, I, I think I'll restart my my uh, presentation. That would be better. So. In recent years, from academic perspective, we've been engaged in urban disasters across the world. And our major research area is taking consideration of uh, the uh, industrial chain and uh, the interdepartmental relations. How are they responding to climate change and disaster management? So. This is a briefing about my presentation. So in recent years, we have uh, found that uh, disasters are having greater impact on our lives. First of all, climate change leads to high te higher temperature, higher sea level, glacier melting, leading to heavy rainfall, hurricanes, and also coastal flooding. All these natural disasters are becoming more frequent in recent years. And on the other hand, uh, if you look at cities, um, accelerated urbanization and higher population density in cities are uh, making more cities exposed to such um, natural disasters, for example, flooding and hurricanes are leading to more risks to cities. And we believe up to now over 80% of cities and over 2 billion people are at high risk of at least one type of natural disasters. Such disasters are not only manifested in direct economic loss, but also um, creating huge threats to our social economic system. In 2017, flooding accounts for the second largest part of disaster-induced economic damage with an average annual loss of 300 billion Chinese yuan, which equates to 16.8% of the total 2017 GDP in the UK. So an increasing number of studies show that the indirect economic impact plays an important role in natural disaster risk analysis and sustainable development as well. So in terms of uh, um, responsibilities, allocation of responsibilities, an increasing pre preference for the notion of governance that allocates responsibility to multiple levels or actors rather than government in which one single authority makes all the decisions has been uh, shown in across the world. So we should not only look at regional natural disaster risks, but also indirect economic loss to different departments in a city so that we could come up with a more effective strategic strategy against climate change. So we engaged in a lot of academic researches in disaster management, but there is still a gap in our research in disaster management as well. For example, most or the majority of researchers are focusing on the indirect economic impact assessment of flood related disasters. Secondly, there's still a scarcity of a generally accepted methodology to assess flood induced indirect economic impacts. Thirdly, there's still a poor understanding of post-disaster economic recovery. That means when we are assessing the post-disaster economic recovery policies. Based on that, in recent years, we have established a flood footprint accounting system or methodology. Through such accounting methodology, we hope to, from the uh, supply chain's perspective, in taking into consideration of uh, multiple factors such as material capital deterioration, uh, labor loss, and the consumption uh, model or resource bottlenecks, uh, we hope to 
gain a qualitative methodology framework of flood footprint analysis and counting either single or multiple um, flood induced economic costs cascading throughout the production supply chains and estimated economic impacts at industrial and regional level in a certain time period with a clear modeling progression. So you see the buzzword flood footprint on this page again, right? Actually, what is food flood footprint? This is a definition that we proposed for facilitation of our research. Flood footprint is a measure of the inclusive total economic impact that is directly and indirectly caused by a flood event to the flooding region and wider economic systems. It proposes a dynamic influence process within a specific economy and sector during a certain affected period. So the emphasis is on dynamic. It not only shows a st static experience, but also the influence on different parts of the economy or different sectors of the economy during and after the disaster. So I need to point out that this is not a, an absolute value. It is only a potential risk value. So there are direct flood footprint and also indirect flood footprint. What direct flood print, footprint means is that it is a physical impact on natural resources, people and tangible assets. In terms of indirect foot, flood footprint, it was caused by the direct impact of the flood. And some other production sectors would be harmed indirectly by the flood. And such footprint cannot be visibly observed by our bare eyes. So if you look at the picture on the right, the horizontal axis is the recovery time and the original point is uh, represents when the disaster took place and the uh, vertical axis is the economic impact. The part in blue is the recovery curve. So our production volume would decrease because of the flood. So you can see a vacuum on this chart. So the part in blue is the indirect flood footprint. That means the total production, total product loss. So um, this is a very complicated chart. If you don't understand now, it's, um, on this, it's uh, we will discuss that later. So this is about methodology of flood footprint accounting. So the input output theory or the flood footprint accounting theory was proposed back in 1970s and it won a Nobel economic price in 1973. So this is a very brief introduction of such a framework. On the chart on the left, you can see a basic input and output chart. For example, products from sector one could be distributed among different sectors after being produced. For example, one part became raw material of uh, one sector. Another one, uh, another part became a final product, which could be directly shipped to customers. And here, the second line means uh, uh, is about the input or the value added in payment sector. So this is a very direct relationship. So in the gray part, you can see internal production relations in different sectors of the economy. The part in green means a relation between the producers and the consumers. 
this is a basic input output chart. How is it connecting producers and consumers? The reason why we look at the input output table as the benchmark of our research is that it is able to capture the interior, uh, industrial, uh, inter industrial, and inter regional linkages. Secondly, it is applicable for impact assessment of disruptive events. And thirdly, and most importantly, it is able to provide macroeconomic effects at regional industrial level when the economy is undergoing abrupt economic destruction. So based on the I.O. table or the input output table, we could establish a basic framework for flood footprint accounting. This is an economic framework of the flood footprint model. So please look at the chart on the left. It's a post-disaster imbalance economy and economy recovery. It mean, um, actually our total input and uh, total output should equal each other. But after the disaster, we might discover that on the one hand, natural disasters in particular flooding would be faced with a lot uh, will create a lot of loss for factories and residents. So in this situation, the facilities were destroyed and damaged, so it has a big impact on the producers. And for labor, when the city is flooded, transportation will stop and uh, so workers cannot commute to factory. So the labor capability will also be compromised. So here you can see that uh, uh, flooding have an uh, impact on both material and the labor for a producer from the um, demand side. Because the uh, houses are down, so we need to rebuild it. So there's a demand of reconstruction. And after disaster, as consumer, their, the way they consume will be different. For example, consumers will spend more money on food, clothes, medical products, or energy related products. So the, we can see the total uh, supply and total demand, they are not matching each other. Then we need to see how to allocate resources to enable the whole system go back to the situation before the disaster. So this is the framework of the flood footprint models. And here I list a few specific novelties, novelties of this model. This is a little bit academic, so I will not go into details here. And this is the mathematic framework of the model. And uh, it has a lot of uh, mathematics, economic uh, formulas, so I will not um, gave too many details here. So we can see that the model work um, in both mathematic and economic way. On the application uh, area, there are also some uh, new things of our model. Uh, first of all, it is suitable for calculating the indirect flood footprint resulting from not only one event, but two or even more events at both industry and regional level. Second, our model allow the various types of sensitivity analysis to external influences. Um, and the third, our model measure the reconstruction damage during the uh, recovery. 
period and is uh, independent. And uh, fourth, uh, our model is more externally oriented and a better fits reality. Uh, so our model can help the local uh, developers and uh, decision makers to come up with a more effective plan. Uh, now I'd like to share a few applications. Uh, the first application is uh, the summer flood in Yorkshire and the Humber in UK in 2007. And the total economic uh, burden is about 2.7 billion pounds, which is uh, big. And 57% uh, of the cost is uh, indirect cost, which is uh, higher than direct cost. And uh, the direct uh, cost uh, is uh, coming from the data of uh, Monique Real insurance. And uh, the uh, city, it took the city 14 months to recover. So to come up with uh, climate change adaptation policy, we need to give more focus to the service sector in the city because they are more sensitive to uh, labor loss. And uh, in the direct uh, flat footprint, as you can see, they uh, labor intensive in the service sector contribute a lot to the indirect damage. On the left hand side, uh, you can see indirect and direct uh, damage distribution. On the bottom, you can see the uh, process of the damage. The second application is uh, the uh, flood event on July the 21st in 2012. The official um, cost uh, is estimated at uh, 21.19 billion RMB. According to our uh, simulation, uh, the footprint is uh, uh, very high, about 1.8% uh, of Beijing GDP in that year. And the indirect part is 9.55 billion. Uh, the rain only for about 16 hours. However, it took 42 weeks for the city to recover. On the left bottom, you can see the food flood of the sectors that has uh, um, damaged more than 500 million RMB. Uh, we find something interesting. First of all, For the sectors uh, which bear a higher share of uh, direct flood footprint. And uh, here, let me explain. The dark red represent direct footprint, and uh, the light uh, red represent indirect cost. And uh, as 37 uh, sector, for example, the direct cost is uh, very high, however, indirect cost is uh, relatively low. And for S1 and S30, these two sectors, so they, their direct footprint is about uh, the same. S1 is agriculture sector, and uh, S30 is transportation uh, sector. And the indirect uh, cost is uh, very different because the indirect uh, cost is not, relate, not only related to direct footprint, but also the production relations between different sectors. So indirect cost evaluation is very important. And here we conduct a few scenario analysis because in the research we found out that it's difficult to get the economic data of uh, 
uh, recovery. We don't have a database or uh, data available to the public uh, to borrow. So we have to simulate uh, uh, different scenarios to see its result. Uh, first, uh, we did a sensitive analysis of labor productivity because the labor are more difficult to recover. And uh, we assume the labor will restore in uh, recover in one week. And uh, that we find out in different scenarios, the indirect uh, cost will be different and a different uh, um, uh, scenarios will have a uh, um, big difference in terms of impact. Second, we um, did analysis of different sectors. For example, in the flood events in Beijing, the local government asked uh, a few sectors like a uh, transportation sector to recover first very quickly. So for these uh, key sectors, they if uh, it takes them longer time to recover, they will have a big impact on the overall picture. So uh, you can see that they also have uh, impact on the overall uh, situation. And the third sensitive analysis is uh, some critical factors. For example, in some cities, the facilities, the factory facilities, equipment uh, are damaged. However, workers can still commute to factory and home. Uh, so we only take into consideration of materials uh, loss, however, other events like COVID-19, um, the facilities are not damaged. However, the containment protocols have uh, prevent workers to walk to, uh, to commute to work in factories. Uh, so with a different uh, sensitivity, um, with the different factors, we can uh, model them. And this is uh, the import and the basic demand sensitivity analysis. Take Beijing for example. The, if we reduce the import, for example, half or three quarters, then the Beijing city cannot recover back to the level before the disaster. Because uh, um, even before, the uh, disaster. A lot of uh, sectors uh, are supported by imports. So without imports, so they will have a big impact on the recovery of uh, Beijing city. And uh, the uh, last three factors uh, refers to without the basic demand, half of the demand and twice of the demand, uh, the more resources uh, you allocate to the general public, the longer it takes for the city to uh, recover. For example, we give enough support to the medical system uh, without other interference measures. If you uh, give, if you give more support to one specific uh, uh, factor or uh, sector, it will have a big impact on the overall uh, recovery. And the third analysis uh, is uh, some delayed recovery. Uh, there can be different reasons for the uh, delay. Uh, for example, the material cannot be uh, transported to the affected city. And uh, so you can see that uh, uh, there's a flat uh, area of the economic loss because of the uh, delay. 
So the delay will increase the risk of the whole economic system. It means that it uh, will uh, make the economic loss bigger. The third application is the typhoon induced economic impact assessment and the policy implications. And this project is also uh, partially funded by the Newton Fund project. And uh, um, you can see how our model is applied to uh, a specific case. And uh, we collect the data from uh, different uh, organizations like insurance companies, uh, uh, container components, uh, climate change, uh, climate centers. Uh, so we collect a lot of the information data from them about the recovery. And uh, we also gave uh, um, uh, from the interviews and uh, data collection, we found that uh, uh, people gave a lot of attention to the assessment of indirect cost, however, um, there are some challenges. Uh, there's a lack of uh, information and data. Up to now, our research offers real-time disaster uh, impairment methodology, but up to now, we don't have adequate data to support it. So you can see our case studies here. They include 2018 Guangdong Shanzhou Typhoon Disaster, 2019 Lakini Typhoon event in China, and then there are also three policy implement implications. So through our methodology and assessment and uh, uh, simulations, we believe that it is important for us to first of all identify the key sectors that can influence the whole recovery of the recovery of a whole region, if especially for sectors with a large loss, indirect loss. So our approach needs to be targeted. Secondly, we hope that through our approach, we could further discuss and define the concept of urban resilience by taking into consideration the economic damage threshold of the different economic systems. That means to identify the threshold for loss from direct disasters. Thirdly, we hope to have further discussions on influences from post-disaster production allocation so that we could uh, stipulate targeted rehabilitation plans. So above our my thinking over our research in flood footprint assessment. So we have issued paper on different, uh, such a paper in different journals, and you can see the links to the journals and to the papers on this slide. So we are doing our academic research work and making our academic contribution to such a topic. And we also welcome um, if you have good data or cases to share with us, you're very welcome also. Thank you very much, Dr. Zen, for your in-depth and uh, wonderful presentation. It is um, forward-looking and uh, it discusses indirect economic losses, which is an infrequent topic in other discussions. So there are some questions to your presentation. First of all, because you have established a very academic model through some academic researches. So will cities really adopt such model to assess their status quo? I mean, when you transition from academic to um, foods on the ground or to paramedic practices, what kind of obstacles we might run into? Thank you. That is a good question. Because 
Just now, I talked to you about our academic perspective to this issue. We also discussed with some companies on how to implement or carry out our study. So I think this issue is also being discussed by companies. They are trying to understand whether they could have authentic values. From an economic perspective, we believe uh, um, authentic or real or absolute values are gained, but those are just theoretical values. But we need to, in practice, consider instead of potential values, looking, which needs to look at real numbers and values. So that is a gap. And the greatest obstacle we've run into is that we don't have a very good the, um, methodology for assessment of a real, um, real life economic loss. When we are stipulating a rehabilitation policy, we need to take into consideration economic theory, of course. And against such a backdrop, for a disaster event, maybe we have already drafted three rehabilitation plans. What we need to do is to, first of all, understanding the proportion of risk in particular, indirect risk. And we need to choose the one with the, the lowest potential indirect risk to our work. So I believe our academic perspective is like a reference to people on the ground. We are not offering an authentic value. We are just offering a potential risk value for your reference for reference of the companies. Secondly, in real, real life cases or real life scenarios, the um, crux of the problem lies in data or authentic data. First of all, um, disaster loss data or um, direct loss data. In UK, US and Netherlands, their direct loss assessment system is well established or full fledged, but for other countries, in particular for underdeveloped countries, we sometimes would only have to rely on authorities or official uh, channels to get the numbers, but we cannot validate the authenticity of the data because some uh, government agencies in certain regions or uh, localities might exaggerate their data, right? due to some interests. So those data could not be reliable and they would lead to some deviations in the outcome if we put those unauthentic data into calculation or into our model. So that is also the crux of the problem. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhang, for your detailed answering to our question. Uh, another question comes up, I think, it is also one question that a lot of our participants are curious about. Imagine we are in a city in a developing country. If we want to leverage your, your model in our assessment, what is the price for such a model? What kind of capacities are required for such a city? Or I believe the quotation for your research, I believe a price quotation. Yeah, we're just in the, we're now only in the research period or research stage. In the past, our research team stayed in UK for a very long period of time. Some local government agencies tried to adopt our model to in their pragmatic cases. So for, for local governments, if you have good data or cases to share with us, or you hope to do something with us, 
you are very welcome. But up to now, we have not made our model a commercial one up to now. Uh, so there's no price quotation up to now because we're still in like research stage. And we are still collecting feedbacks from our partners because we're doing this research um, with no commercial purposes during this stage. So we also welcome um, more feedbacks or comments from our partners or from participants to this meeting. But up to now, we're not selling it. But if you are trying to apply to the higher authorities to some projects and you hope to collaborate with us, welcome to contact me. Thank you very much for your answer. Another question is, just now we saw that uh, there were two cases as regards Beijing and UK. So how long did it take for you to establish such a model for a city in um, China or in the UK? Not very long, actually. Probably you could come up with a result within one month because a large chunk of our time is spent in compilation of data in initial stage. For example, data collection, uh, collection of data of direct economic loss for different departments. So those took a long period of time. Most of the time were spent in uh, data collection in the initial stage or in preliminary stage. But model building or modeling does not take a very long time. And it depends to a great extent on compilation of uh, data collected in, in the initial stage. So our data comes for not only from government reports, but also disaster relief practices and companies, for example, insurance companies, because they are doing simulations over disaster events. And we also have uh, um, literature research. We can imagine a scenario and do analysis in accordance with that. Thank you very much. So a last question for you, Dr. Zeng. So I think, so, uh, what pers perspective that you're taking in your flood footprint assessment? Do you think your model um, could be widely applied in many other areas apart from disaster relief? Thank you for that question. This is a very good question. First of all, um, in China, the disaster loss uh, statistics in China uh, actually has uh, an official channel. So uh, departments at different um, levels of our government are responsible for collecting such data. And some companies, for example, insurance companies are also uh, collecting such data. For example, from the agricultural sector after a disaster. So from two channels, first of all, government channel, and secondly, companies, for example, insurance companies. What is your second question exactly? Sorry. So the second question is, um, if you look at the industrial chain, what do you think your model, uh, what other areas do you think your model could be applied in? Okay. For our model, when we were building our model, we hoped that it could be widely applied in different areas or in different regions. So yeah, we believe in the future, it could be widely applied in many other areas. Up to now, you need to know, first of all, the direct loss of a sector and the impact on the local population. If you have two data sets as regards the previous two areas, you could create a very valuable model for a certain sector. Thirdly, I think it does not only apply to disaster response, but also um, emergencies, public emergencies. For example, COVID-19. 
our research team is also doing the uh, uh, research into the economic loss incurred by COVID-19. And it, our paper has also been published on Nature. So short-term emergencies, in particular public emergencies, would deal a great loss or blow to the economy both directly and indirectly. For example, three months financial crisis could also deal with a huge blow to many other sectors in the economy, right? Great. We have received a bunch of questions, so maybe a few questions, a few more questions, okay? Yeah. Um, the other question is about your model, so So can your model be applied to a certain scale of region, for example, to a city or to a region or only apply to a nation? Thank you. Yeah, I think at different levels, it is feasible. I mentioned earlier that we need the input and output data. And uh, for China, uh, we have five-year plan. So if you want to do uh, this uh, assessment on the national level uh, is uh, fine as long as you have the input and output uh, table. Um, I mean, the interconnection between different sectors. It can also be applied for a city as long as you have this uh, input, output, and internal relationship. And can also be applied on the worldwide. For example, some of our members um, use this model to look at the flood event in Ghana and uh, the forest fire in the United States and the typhoon events in other countries. So the scope of this model is pretty wild, uh, wide and uh, can be applied in different uh, uh, areas, but uh, the that we know this model very well, and uh, because the model is still in code, it is not uh, vision uh, does not have very uh, clear uh, I mean vision to the normal users, uh, and uh, we are still at the preliminary development stage of the model. So you have to use a lot of code uh, in the uh, modeling. So, uh, I mean, you can, regular user cannot use the model and uh, have to be us to input the data. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Zhang for your uh, great uh, input and the sharing uh, for the wonderful uh, speech and the model. And uh, so it's almost the time of uh, this afternoon session. So I'd like to come to the closing ceremony of uh, today's session. Uh, I really appreciate your participation. The session two and the session three will be held uh, from 2.30 to 5.15 p.m. Uh, Korea uh, time, Korea so time, uh, or 1.30 to 4.15 uh, p.m. Beijing time. And I saw that a few, quite a few uh, audience asked for the uh, video or the PowerPoints of this session. And when the recording is done, we will share them on our website. And for the Chinese users, we will share the recordings in a cloud database. If you are interested, please contact us. I would like to share with you. And if we get the consent of our speakers, we also share 
uh, the PowerPoints, the speakers of PowerPoints uh, on our website. And uh, I also like to invite you to fill up the questionnaire to give us a feedback on the uh, workshop um, so we can improve our um, projects uh, in the future. Thank you for your participation and see you on one on see you on Thursday.